Our presenter today will be Dr. Alexander Rudnev, a senior quantum physicist at CoQuanta working with the quantum computer team. He has pioneered built some of the building blocks and the fundamental Excuse me, he has pioneered building some of the fundamental blocks for quantum networks during his PhD work at Georgia Institute of Technology with the Alex Kuzmich Group. Alex has worked in a variety of industries in Silicon Valley. While there, he continued his education at Stanford University in statistics and machine learning. Today, he will give a high level introduction to quantum networks, the why, how, and what. Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear me well. Thank you for the kind introduction, Diane. Here's my virtual laser pointer, check. And first of all, let's connect. I'm very happy to be here to uh, tell you about the quantum networks. Uh, while I'm talking about myself, I would like to learn more about you as the audience. Uh, if you could post in the chat uh, your city and your primary role, whether it's business engineering and, or, or science, so I can gauge uh, who is in the audience today. I see Netherlands engineering, Berlin science, USA, Professor QIS, fantastic. We have. Wow, so many people. Uh, I'm very honored to share uh, what I know about quantum networks and hopefully uh, you will get at something from this talk. It's geared for the broader audience on a very high level. So for the experts, it, uh, it may not be as interesting, although I'll touch on some points that you might find interesting. To make it more engaging for you, uh, please look out for any uh, gaps, inaccuracies, and share feedback with me later on LinkedIn. About myself, I am an engineer physicist that was born and raised in uh, Siberia. You see here on the right, there's city of Kutsk next to Lake Baikal. There's a beautiful lake one mile deep, 20% of potable water on Earth, and now it's the Irkutsk is the capital of cryptocurrency mining thanks to the cheap electricity from that lake. I studied physics in Irkutsk and then Moscow Engineering Physics Institute and then continued uh, physics studies at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where I did most of my quantum networks um, research that I'm gonna talk about today. And after that, I went to Silicon Valley, uh, did some data science as the physicists like to do, and came back to Boulder, Colorado uh, to build an atomic clock at NIST, and now I'm at Cold Quanta building a quantum computer. Other than loving my wife and daughter, and I love technology, and Lindy Hop, part of the swing dancing family. Let's start with why. Why are we here today to learn about the quantum networks? What problems do they solve? Look at this picture here. Uh, it's uh, some soldiers setting up some equipment, and I put it there uh, to share this usual story that to establish a secure communication between two sites, whether it's two military bases or two banks or two presidents, you need to use uh, class classical encryption, let's say advanced encryption standard algorithm, uh, which is open as an algorithm and the whole secrecy is in the encryption keys, those secrets that you need to distribute between the two parties. And the most secure way to do it is to handcuff a case full of encryption keys to soldiers and then ship them so they can distribute those keys securely, uh, not over internet, which is not secure. That sounds pretty expensive and slow. So the question is, is there is something better? It turned out to be there is a promising technology coming from quantum physics uh, that can do that. And it is one of the applications of quantum network is a quantum key distribution protocol that would allow to generate these encryption keys between two parties and the security of them will be guaranteed by fundamental laws of physics, of course, with some caveats. Uh, so it's one of the applications I'm gonna talk about today, you'll learn how it works. And then I'll also touch on a more futuristic uh, applications uh, in quantum computing when uh, 
companies build quantum computers, for example, um, using ions, they have certain limitations on scale, how many ions they can use in their quantum computer, and they'll need to connect multiple uh, quantum computing processors together, and they'll need this to build a quantum network to share quantum information between the computers. So this quantum network will be crucial for scaling up quantum computers. And once we have quantum computers and quantum devices, then we'll share information between them and we'll build the quantum internet. And I'll touch on some of the applications there as well. Hopefully now I convince you that there's something useful there. And I want to put it in the perspective, uh, where are we in the quantum stack, in the quantum technology in general? I like this uh, taxonomy of three quantum levels. Uh, there is a fundamental level of uh, quantum physics utilizing uh, super superposition of quantum states and quantum levels. And that level is already heavily commercialized. The lasers that have been used and atomic clocks and the GPS satellites that do timekeeping and enable GPS for you, they all utilize the uh, quantum physics features uh, that there are discrete configuration of atoms that are possible and you can put them in a uh, superposition that uh, uh, let's say an atom can be simultaneously in two different states. And that is routinely done in these uh, devices and you're, you're already a beneficiary of that. Uh, I briefly estimated based on research on Google, the total addressable market for that level is somewhere between 100 billion to $1 trillion. Uh, it's probably the right order of magnitude. And then quantum physics offers other very interesting phenomena, which I'm going to touch. Uh, one of them is quantum entanglement, and that's what would enable, let's say, this quantum key distribution and quantum networks. And this is uh, the topic today. Uh, I don't know yet what's the value of that yet. Probably also maybe the same order of magnitude, maybe higher, I don't know. And there is a, a higher level, uh, level three, which enables uh, computation. You can use uh, this idea of qubits that bits can be simultaneously in state zero and one to create this huge Hilbert space. And you can compute something which is intractable for classical computers. And that's what we're building at Cold Quanta here, a quantum computer. And to put this in the, this iceberg picture that our CEO uh, showed in the, in the webinar previously, a quantum computer is the tip of the iceberg. And then underneath you have all other applications and different levels of applications of quantum technology. To me, it's a very exciting time where uh, the research and science are reaching this stage where there is funding from both government and venture capital to commercialize this technology and move the progress of human hand forward and make something good of it. Uh, so Evan um, already gave a webinar on atomic clocks and the next webinar is gonna be from Mark Safman on quantum computing. And today we're talking about uh, level two in quantum entanglement, uh, quantum key distribution and so forth. Uh, before I start talking about that, I need to give you crush course on the quantum mechanics and hopefully it's going to be fun. At least I want to introduce some of the terminology so that when you hear them in this talk or elsewhere, it's not scary uh, and you know what is going on. This here is uh, Schrodinger's equation, which is the, uh, the pinnacle or essence of quantum mechanics, which tells how our world is behaving. And so let's deconstruct it a little bit. And there are fun parts here. Uh, so for example, there's this funny notation. You see there's the vertical bar and there's a psi uh, de dependence on time. And there's this angle here. So this, what is called ket. And this is what in, let's say, Amazon bracket uh, quantum computing platform that enables the, uh, or connects quantum computers by providers with, with customers. Uh, they chose a very good name, so I can use it here. So this bracket, it's a notation in, in quantum mechanics. And the cat there is this part uh, that defines a state of the system that you're working with, whether it's an atom or a cat or anything. And bra is its uh, 
kind of the mirror image, it's a map of that state to, to a number. Uh, so if, if you see this here, this is what people mean by bracket. And other fun things here. So to me, it's always a fun thing to talk about. The imaginary unit is square root of minus one. There is my favorite XKCD comic about it. And it's, it started as some mathematical abstraction. Actually, it's in physics in the fundamental equation, which is very surreal. Uh, so that's there. And there is this H bar is the smallest amount of angular momentum or kind of rotation comes in Heisenberg uncertainty. And also if I drive by um, Hyatt bar, which is called H bar, it cracks me up because I think it's about that. It's probably not. Uh, so anyway, so this is the equation that uh, will tell you how your system will behave if you have certain interaction with, with anything uh, driven by this uh, operator of Hamiltonian. If we expand on the, uh, the quantum states, I need to introduce this uh, terminology of quantum superposition, and you probably know about this, a famous Schrodinger's cat. Uh, this is a weird feature of quantum mechanics that something like even a cat can be simultaneously dead and alive. And we can create those superpositions and it's working and it's already in our GPS satellite atomic clocks and we're already making use of it, which is kind of both weird and cool at the same time. Uh, and the important feature here, you can create those quantum superpositions, but once you observe it, you can only observe one thing. You cannot observe the uh, quantum superposition directly, only observe one state uh, with certain probabilities dictated by the state. And that's very important um, in the quantum key distribution that I'm gonna tell you later. Uh, so how are we gonna make money of this? So uh, step one, we're gonna prepare this uh, quantum state, let's call it qubit, in simultaneously uh, two states, zero and one. Then we have magic step two, and step three is profit. So what is in that step two? Uh, so let's move to an uh, easier uh, system. Let's say we have a ball that can be simultaneously red and green at the same time in this quantum superposition. So that will be a photon, for example. Uh, so if we prepare it in that superposition, uh, and you start seeing it with your eyes, sometimes it will be red, sometimes it will be green, and the probability will be equal to one half. And then it, uh, we move to the next phenomenon, which is quantum entanglement. And after that, you'll know how the quantum key distribution works. Imagine now I have a magic box that creates a very special pair of photons that are flying to the left and right. And it's in this uh, entangled state such that if you would find uh, one ball that is red, the other one will be also red. And if you found the other ball green, uh, then uh, the first one ball is also green. So there is the perfect correlation and you, you could measure it. Uh, if Alice and Bob uh, detect colors of this each photon in each run, you see there is, will be perfect correlation. If Alice detects the red one, it will be red one uh, at Bob's sites. And the funny thing is it doesn't matter how far apart Alice and Bob are, and this would confuse Einstein. Yeah, I'm confused myself by this. Uh, so I, that was the biggest issue with quantum mechanics Einstein had, and there's the famous uh, EPR pa paradox um, to indicate how weird quantum mechanics is, is that you create this quantum superposition and these photons can fly thousands of miles and nobody knows are they gonna be green or red. But as soon as Alice sees it's red, Bob immediately know it's red. So this is instantaneous um, knowledge uh, that, that uh, sort of looks like it's transfer, but actually it's not because the transfer happens as the photons fly out. There is nothing faster than speed of light communication here, uh, not to be confused, but it's still weird. How can we use it? Well, as we said earlier, uh, when you start observing those quantum states, then you fundamentally destroy it. So then if somebody wants to eavesdrop on our little experiment here, let's say a third person come in called Eve, and they want to eavesdrop on us to see what they were talking about, then as soon as they start observing the colors uh, of the photons, let's say that goes to Bob, then they'll destroy the correlations and Bob will notice that and that's the key. So now you can imagine how to build a quantum key distribution system. 
So you, let's say you want to generate a random sequence of numbers at Alice at Bob sites that you know that nobody know nobody else knows. So what you do, you, you get this magic box, you start sending um, photons, let's say, uh, to Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob, they measure this correlation. And if the correlation checks out that they know that it's the original entangled state, uh, then they know that nobody look at the, at the photons and they write down the keys and then use it for classical encryption. But if they notice that correlation is gone, then they know somebody was looking at it. So they discard those keys and wait until they can see again the correlation. And this is, and this is it. This is quantum key distribution system. Uh, the way to generate keys for classical encryption. And you have some confidence that uh, you are not eavesdrop based on the fundamental physics uh, that if somebody looks at your at this photons at the quantum level, then uh, the information is destroyed and you know about it. So this is all good. And it's actually this magic box that already exists in the market. Uh, if you Google quantum key distribution products, uh, you'll find a variety of them. I think the first one I've heard of was from a company, ID Quantique. Uh, they sell these, these black boxes and they produce these photons. And there's another one from Ozoptics. And what uh, made me happy that now you see in the performance specifications of a product, you start to see these bracket notations. So now if you see a product with some bracket notations there, you know what it means. Uh, so it's all great. And there is a, a legendary story. Uh, I don't know if it's a myth or not, uh, but when ID Quantique introduced this product a while ago, their sales were sort of slow because it's a new thing. And then Snowden happened. And then after that, everybody went in their system and they couldn't keep up with, uh, with orders, with purchase orders. Uh, so it's an interesting uh, story that indicates that this technology has this potentially tipping points some black swan events that will drive the adoptions. It's uh, fascinating to see how it's going to develop. All right, so this is all awesome. And uh, where you have this uh, on the markets and are we done? No, because this products only work on the short distance about 100 miles. And there is a fundamental reason about it. Uh, they use optical fibers to send those photons in and those photons will decay. And uh, you would ask, well, how do we have internet? And then let me clear this out. Uh, so let's say you probably heard this uh, story from New York Times posted this, and there's supposed to be a plain video. I don't know why it's not playing right now. Uh, but recently there was another cute animal cloned. And what does it mean to be cloned? We copied some classic information to the DNA and then used it to create an animal. Uh, so that's great. It works on complex things like biologic elements, but cloning doesn't work on the uh, quantum level. This is sort of the flip side of the same phenomenon that if somebody looks at the quantum state of anything, uh, you start destroying it. So there's this famous non-cloning theorem, and that's the biggest obstacle. So if in the a normal case with the internet telecommunication fibers, you have the same problem of your laser pulses, their getting weaker and weaker as they propagate through fibers, but it's not a problem. You just buy optical fiber amplifier, you stick it in and amplify the laser pulse and you can still transmit cat images. Uh, but with quantum information it doesn't work because as soon as you start doing anything with this photons, then you start changing the information and it doesn't work. So it seems like a dead end, but we have a workaround. It's called quantum repeaters. It's a brilliant name. It's kind of controversial. We just said we cannot clone quantum information. How can we repeat it? Uh, it's, a, it's a workaround. There is a scheme, and I want to just give a brief introduction how it works without going to too much detail. Uh, but there is an important uh, message here that uh, what is needed to achieve that. So let's say uh, I have Alice and Bob separated now by 120 miles, and it's beyond the distance uh, where the photons would propagate through fiber. What can we do? What if we stick in the middle a, a magical box here, which is actually a quantum memory? Uh, and let's say we first generate this quantum entangled state between the Alice and intermediate state uh, memory here and between Bob and intermediate state M there. 
And then uh, we do a magical operation here, which is actually a projected measurement. We d detect the state in, in these memories and it will create the entangled state of uh, uh, Alice and Bob separated by twice longer distance, which is great. And then you can see how you can scale it, uh, just build a binary tree, and then you can have uh, arbitrary length um, quantum communication. And this is how we would build long distance quantum telecommunication with this quantum repeater. And to do that, we need this magical element quantum memory. We need something that will store qu quantum information for sufficiently long time. And we can interface with it, engineer this entangled state. And uh, this is what I was working on at uh, Georgia Tech. And uh, in, in the neighboring room, my buddy Yarik was building the long distance quantum memory uh, and improving its lifetime. And I was interfacing it with telecommunication fibers because that memory works on the colors of light, which are not propagating well in fibers uh, that we already have. Uh, but we found that found a way to use atoms themselves to this efficient co color change on a single photon level and establish a, a quantum link through a, a normal telecommunication fiber. And we also built some building blocks for uh, speeding up this uh, communication protocols for using multiplexing. Uh, that, was, that was a fun time. So the, the key point, we need this quantum memory and it's not there on the market yet. There are lots of platforms and lots of companies and uh, labs are pursuing that. And it's now getting to the exciting time where it's actually getting commercialized. Uh, so there's a brief kind of overview of very rough uh, orders of magnitude how things perform. If you wanna buy a quantum memory, uh, which you probably can, cannot yet, uh, you need to worry how long the quantum information will live, how efficiently you can write and read, what's the cost and how well it's going to be interfaced uh, with the infrastructure, let's say telecommunication fibers. And we have uh, atoms, ions, and many atoms in the ensembles. Uh, we have room temperature with uh, lifetimes about 10 to 500 microseconds, pretty high efficiency. Uh, here at Cold Quanta, we use uh, laser cooled atoms, which are thousands of million times cold in outer space. And that gives some benefits like coherence times that can be pushed to seconds or even minutes, uh, pretty high efficiency. The other uh, candidates with solid state crystals, I think the latest uh, lifetimes were still in the microseconds. They're NV centers in diamonds, they're quantum dot superconductors and uh, some nanomechanical um, systems. Uh, there is a lot going on. And uh, everybody's still researching. It's not in the market. If you Google buy quantum memory, the only get is some books on your memory. Uh, but it's now the tipping point where actually we might see some products very soon. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, there is lots of research in academia. Uh, the notable paper was a demonstration of this uh, protocol as described uh, by uh, John Van Penn. And in industry, uh, we, we have lots of companies already providing short distance quantum key distribution. And in the long distance, there are uh, commercial efforts as well. Uh, there is a startup, uh, QNECT, um, I talked to one of their co-founders. And as far as I understood, we could expect something within 18 months, the whole uh, stack of building a quantum repeater technology and testing it. Um, I think I noticed it in IEEE Spectrum. Uh, there was a, a hint of, of that work happening and they reached out. Uh, here at Cold Quanta, uh, there is a team building uh, quantum memory that's gonna be tested by NASA. Uh, so it's fun stuff. Uh, would be nice if, if you shoot me a message later, uh, if you have something going on to update the slides. There's probably something cool stuff going on the DOD we had to know about. And there is another project going on by the Department of Energy that I know of that to utilize existing network of dark fiber across the country uh, to use that to build quantum networks, which is exciting time. And I think there's a, a European um, team also working on this quantum computer project. Uh, so to me, this is great to see that this research is going and it's now getting to the point where it's about to make money and there is a uh, private investment going into it. This is going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen in the next two, five, 10 years. And when we get there, what are we going to do? Uh, I like this uh, 
paper about quantum blockchain. Uh, and it's, there is a common theme how the quantum computers on quantum level three are uh, sort of threatening the cryptography and cryptocurrencies with the fact that they would be able to execute this compute heavy operations of either factoring large numbers or maybe hashing for Bitcoin mining. And they would basically make uh, either old encryption protocols obsolete or the old uh, blockchain protocols obsolete. And then there is a, on this quantum level too, there is a quantum networks that provide solution to replace the, the threatened technologies. It's quite a neat business model. And there is um, one paper uh, where the authors describe how uh, when quantum computers will be there, they'll threaten the blockchain uh, in, in a classical implementation. But there, here's the solution. Here's a quantum blockchain, which is quite exciting. Uh, also interesting that I think that article that was saying something like how fascinating the cryptocurrency market reached $30 billion dollars. Uh, market cap and the last time I checked it was about around trillion, uh, which is also developing fast. So back to, back to now, uh, what I told you is uh, quantum technology is at some level on the, on the level one is, is already commercialized and now companies in academia and government are working on bringing a level two this quantum networks and level three quantum computing to the market as well. This is exciting time. Uh, on that note, uh, next webinar will be by our uh, chief science officer, it's called Quanta, the atomic approach to quantum computing. So please uh, join that one. And also we are hiring here to, to build the most powerful quantum computer. And we're looking for everybody. We're looking for a quantum physicist. If you're AMO background, like laser cooled atoms and precise manipulation of them with lasers, uh, let, let me know. We're looking for DevOps to keep our uh, service running. We're looking for electrical engineer, software engineer. Uh, please send me your info or referrals. And on that note, it's uh, all this quantum technology to me as a technology lover, is a really cool place to be because it's the tallest technical stack you can imagine. And I think this applies for the quantum networks and quantum computing. If you start with atoms, single photons, single atoms, and you have quantum physics going on and you have lasers to manipulate that, you have imaging systems, you have all these FPGAs and firmware, you move up to higher control software in Python and there is machine learning to optimize things efficiently. And we need to think about the compiler for quantum circuits and you build a web API so customers can submit their quantum circuits. And then you have the actual quantum circuits and algorithms to map the business problems to quantum computing. And it's uh, quite an exciting time in the technological progress of humankind. All right, on that, thank you very much for listening and uh, let's hear what questions you have. Thanks, Alex. That was great. Um, so I have a couple of questions here. What is the quantum repeater made of? Uh -huh. You choose. Uh, so let me go back to the, to the slide. So we have multiple options. So you can make uh, them out of atoms, ions, atomic ensembles. So let's say if you choose a room temperature, uh, version, then we have a glass cell that uh, has atoms flying around in the cell uh, and you have laser beams interacting with those atoms. And that's going to be the core physics package. And then we have uh, the control electronics photon detectors to uh, uh, make a quantum repeater out of that. If you move to the laser cooled version, then we have uh, also a glass cell uh, now with a very good vacuum to and laser cooling to bring in room temperature atoms to almost crawling speeds of few millimeters per second. And uh, again, lasers shooting in those atoms and then fibers and detectors and all of that to integrate. If you choose a, a solid state crystal, then you have literally a crystal, like a few millimeters, few centimeters type of dimensions. And again, you'll have lasers there 
shooting into it and uh, pre-generating some excitations in this crystal. Uh, if you have NV centers, you have a diamond uh, where some of the uh, carbon atoms are displaced with nitrogen and the extra like atoms and you have again lasers shooting into them and the imaging system looking at them and so forth. You have quantum dots and superconductor Josephson junctions um, will be a, a chip on the scale of a uh, fraction of a millimeter or so with a bunch of RF cables probably in a uh, very expensive dilution refrigerator to make it keep it cold. Uh, so it's built on you, you can build a quantum repeater on any of these systems, which is typically some either natural things like atoms, crystals, or uh, machines, or manufactured, human-made things like superconductor Josephson junctions. Great, thank you. And can the quantum network connect directly with a quantum computer now? I think so. I think I already have seen experiments where people do this. People connect different quantum registers between different quantum computers using this quantum network protocol. So I think so. I think the latest and greatest results already demonstrating that as a proof of principle type of thing. Great. Thank you. And then any idea what the information transfer, transfer rates might be with these systems? Uh -huh. Yes, uh, if we look at commercially available systems, uh, let's say if you're using this uh, quantum key distribution systems, then the fastest I've seen are on the order of 10 megabits per second. I think it's in the short distance, about 10, 20, 30 kilometers. And then as you go longer, longer distance, uh, then it crawls down to something like 10 kilobits per second if you go to uh, 100 kilometers. So if you're using the quantum repeater approach, let's say that paper uh, from February 2020, I think, I don't remember the top of the head, probably way slower, probably on the few hertz level, uh, maybe up to kilohertz at most. So that's, I think those are the type of scales you see. So you need to keep in mind those are essentially single photon type experiments, which is similar to what you know you would do in a nuclear physics. We just have single photon counters and things like that that uh, brings the challenge of the speed. Okay. Can you provide more um, information regarding the quantum memory device being developed by Cold Quanta for NASA? And can you point to any relevant papers? I will delegate that question to Yinju, who is leading the research and development there. Uh, Yinju, let's see, are you either audio or can you reply in the chat? Which one do you prefer? So we'll have Yinju type an answer to Michael on that one. Yep. Um, is there a fidelity requirement for quantum repeaters to be useful for QKD? And, and then a follow-up to that is, is there an equivalent of an error correction threshold for quantum mm -hmm. computing? I think the answer is a yes to both. And uh, I don't remember exact situation there, but there gotta be a, a fidelity threshold to make it practical and also uh, withstands the attacks. They're also, you know, you, on the paper, it is a security guaranteed by, by laws of physics, but there are quantum physicists who can become quantum hackers and they can do all kinds of tricks to your channels to make you believe you have a secure communication, but you don't. So pretty sure the fidelity would come in in both the usefulness and security there. In terms of error corrections, there's probably this as well. I, I'm not up to date on that. Okay, thank you. And what are the most important fundamental and techno technical limitations for the complete development of quantum networks? I think on a higher level, it's uh, these four things that are listed here is the lifetime of the quantum information in the memory. 
and the efficiency and the cost, well, and the architectural choice that dictates the interface. And I think all four of them are challenging and still uh, people are trying to figure out to work around. So for each system, it's going to be uh, its own problem. Why, why is it so bad? For example, if we, I remember the first atomic ensembles, they started with about 30 microseconds coherence times. And then you had some problems with uh, magnetic field sensitivities. And then you fix that by using magnetically insensitive uh, states. And then you move to the motion that atoms still moving around. So you pin them with an optical tweezer and then you have something else. So in, in each case, it's uh, each platform has its own issues and it boils down to decoupling your system from the environment in, in some case, whether it's making uh, the temperature cold enough so that the neighboring atoms don't perturb your state by motion, by thermal motion, or you have some losses, you have fundamental interaction between your lasers or microwave cables to your devices, motor strong. Uh, so it's a combination of understanding physics and finding the right physical parameters to work for you. And also having the technology uh, to support your crazy ideas, for example, uh, some basic things like detecting single photons at telecommunication wavelengths is still not uh, the best as we would want. We want nearly 100% efficiency and zero dark counts. And if you buy something on the shelf, you get powers from that. And let's say at NIST, there is a group that is developing some new technology of using uh, phase transitions detectors to do that. And um, that's that is type of uh, the problems that have been solved. Okay, could you please elaborate on the approximate power requirements for quantum repeaters using quantum atoms? Let's see, it's not that high. There is nothing really high power going on. So let's say if you're in the academic lab, you can power your node with a standard outlets that are in the lab. So, you know, one to 10 kilowatts is uh, more than enough type of thing. And then as you start shrinking, and then you may, if, if your power requirements are uh, getting lower than that, let's say if you want to use it for military applications and you don't have a power outlet, you need to run on the battery, then yeah, you start getting into fundamental issues of powering up your lasers. And you know, those are on the order of uh, 100 milliwatts or so, but there is electronics and controllers. And that's what uh, is currently developed quite heavily on the quantum level one in atomic clocks. For example, DARPA has lots of funding for low power, low uh, size atomic clocks that can be deployed in, in the military applications. And there you start getting, um, you run into issues that yeah, you need to heat yourself and there's a heater, right? Things like that. You need to run ion pump. So there's, it's, there is no one single, um, one pole in a tent, it's a bunch of small things like that that add up. Okay. And how do you quantify the data capacity of a quantum communication system? How do you define it, the data capacity? Correct. How do you, how do you, he said, how do you quantify the data capacity? Quantify? And it, it follows up with a question of the number of bell pairs distributed per second over a given distance. Right, uh, exactly. For an initial application like quantum key distribution, that will be a uh, figure of merit is how many useful encryption key classical bits you have generated per second. So that's that's the figure of merit there. When you're connecting quantum computers is how many quantum states have you transferred per second. So I think those, those would be the two general figure of merits on classical 
application or quantum application. Okay, and our next question, regarding the lasers used for atomic-based memories and computers, how would the ideal laser, um, how would this look like from a quantum engineer's perspective? What do you think is the biggest technological challenge to solve for those lasers? Ah, thank you for asking that. I hope the laser manufacturers are listening. I want a very small box that you connect to it and just tell, I want this many watts of power with this uh, level of noise and this modulation and of this wavelengths and just push the button and it creates that magical beam that doesn't exist. <laughs> there is this, uh, what is known a rainbow problem to cover uh, all colors that we need with the uh, lasers of sufficient quality. Let's say if we are dealing with uh, very precise manipulation of single atoms with lasers, your laser needs to be very high quality in terms of its, um, what is called line width or coherence, how the electric field of the uh, laser field, how ideal sinusoid is. Is it ideal sinusoid for a microsecond or, or a second? So ideally we want uh, infinite power, uh, zero line width or infinite co coherence time and uh, arbitrary uh, modulation of amplitude, phase and frequency. I would, I would buy that. Okay, would it be possible to mimic a quantum network with a quantum atomic register? Quantum atomic register. It depends what you mean by quantum atomic register. Uh, if we have, if the quantum atomic uh, re register is uh, a quantum, is a way of quantum memory bits, the qubits, and we have sufficient uh, efficiency to talk to them, then yeah, that will be part of the quantum repeater. That's basically what it is. It's the quantum register with some number of qubits that can be interfaced with. Okay, and I think that you mentioned that the current QKD speeds at a short distance is the MBS range. What's mm -hmm. preventing, what is preventing a higher giga, terabit, et cetera, rates? Mm -hmm. Let's see. I think in that particular architecture, and I'm not an expert in that particular implementation, but as far as I remember, uh, the usual way people generate those entangled photons is with a nonlinear crystal, uh, which you can buy costs about a few thousand dollars probably. And you send uh, one laser beam of one color, uh, let's say it's blue and it, the nonlinear process there generates photons uh, pairs of uh, a different color that are uh, twice smaller energy. So one incoming photon is breaking down into two photons. And that how many photons you send dictates how many photons you uh, generate. And I think you cannot send infinite amount of incoming photons because then you'll get out of the quantum regime and your quantum uh, entanglement properties quality will deteriorate this fidelity. So I think that's probably where the fundamental limitation is, is uh, the trade-off between the your quality of the entangled photon pairs and the rate you are producing it. Okay, and this is gonna be our last question, Alex, get you off the hot seat. <laughs> um, how is Cold Quanta planning to contribute to the quantum internet infrastructure? Very good question. And I wish I had uh, our whole team from Cold Quanta to answer that because we are essentially uh, enabling all the quantum levels uh, from providing uh, equipment to build quantum devices to 
building actual devices like clocks uh, and quantum memory and quantum computers. So we're the full quantum stack company uh, that provide uh, both the shovels to the gold diggers and we dig gold ourselves. Great, thank you for an excellent presentation and thank you all for attending. We look forward to having you next month for Mark Safman on our Cold Atom Quantum Computing webinar. Have a great rest of the week. <laughs>